now going to slide number two we're going to talk about case histories today following up the lecture before and um Again, I, ex I expect your background is in electrical geophysics. You understand the conductivity of rocks. We will review magnetotellurics and control source EM and then look at some of the applications. Please interrupt and ask questions. We have two hours time. We have easy enough material and I can skip material if we run out of time. Let me just give you a little bit the history. Um, magnetotellurics was invented in the 1950s, the way it's being used by the industry. The original magnetotellurics or geomagnetic depth sounding was invented about 100 years earlier. And um, the biggest cre credit went to Kenya for a publication in geophysical prospecting, a Frenchman, but he never did anything with it. And the magnetotelluric method was actually mostly developed at MIT um, and around Boston, um, but they gave a lot of credit still to Kenya for that. Then controlled source, for the controlled source methods, we are essentially improving the signal by bringing our own source. Magnetotelluric uses a source in um, the mag magnetic field of the Earth, and when you bring your own source, you get a better coupling to the um, ground and um, among those are multiple techniques there is controlled source audio magnetotellurics there was early commercial work done in the 1970s it's still being used um, but it not it is not really a tool that goes deep enough for geothermal and hydrocarbon applications. And I focus today only on the depths range between one to three kilometers or deeper, like let's say five or six kilometers. Um, low temperature is a time domain version of CSEM uh, for long after transient electromagnetics. Early commercial work was done in the 1980s and it's presently being revisited by several groups. There has been a lot induced polarization done, um, in particular in Russia and China. They have not been successful in the West. Um, what has been successful are dipole-dipole measurements, in particular in geothermal. Um, but again, uh, because of the depth range, it's not very commercial. Then let's talk about... Um, the drawback for all of these techniques is that the global market is really, really small. Now, the, our Russian colleagues say there's a lot of work in Iran, and, but the question is not how much little work there is, but are they drilling, are they finding oil, are they doing repeat work? And even when you are successful, it doesn't mean that it's being done again. Um, and the reason is that there is very little education in electromagnetics at the universities, which is one of the reasons why I volunteered to give this presentation. Um, in the marine environment, early work in marine electromagnetics was done in the US, Canada, Russia, and later in Europe. The commercialization started by EMGS, a Norwegian company, in 2000. And they are today the only serious commercial player. There are several other sub-players, um, but they really don't make much of an impact. The methods in the marine is marine MT. It's standard, but it's being underutilized by the industry. And the reason is that controlled source EM gives a uh, better coupling and more reliable data um, and it can also see resistive layers which means it can see oil reservoirs um, usually csem refers to frequency domain but today it also refers to time domain because time domain in the marine environment is underutilized only for special application in Russia, also induced polarization is used in the marine environment with um, some additional work starting in Norway. 
Um, and um, my opinion is that it has a limited lifetime. There are various reasons for it. In land electromagnetics, um, electromagnetics was always there in the geothermal world. Although MT is the most commonly used technique, mostly because the interpretation tools are readily available. Um, the surveys are usually small, and um, the integration is important, but it's still only experimental. Only through the integration have people been able to show uh, sufficient success. There is an interest in monitoring, but the progress is exceptionally slow because it's very difficult to convince the oil company to do anything exotic. There is also an interest in fracture detection, but only in a commercial phase. There is limited um, solid backup from the scientific community and from the peer review that has not been questioned among the scientists. Now, this picture, unfortunately, um, there is an image behind it which didn't come through because there's a memory issue here with Google. Um, I, there is this salt dome, and these are boreholes, so I'll skip this picture. Now, if you look at the spectrum of resistivity methods, we have first um, different frequencies, and all of the electromagnetic resorts are sinusoids. We have direct current, which goes down to zero, zero frequency. I have to get rid of this. Um, you go up to 20 kilohertz. Um, that is... Um, the frequency of logging tools, for instance, and then you go up to the megahertz, which are radar tools and gigahertz. So these are, are the different techniques. The physics is that up to about um, 10 kilohertz, you're talking about up to about uh, uh, 100 hertz, you're talking about conduction, and then up to about um, uh, 10 to the fifth, you talk about um, induction and then when you go over um, two to four megahertz you talk about propagation you add uh, the dielectric constant and the displacement current in maxwell equations so that's the radar range um, for logging tools the very low frequency tools are case toll tools and the higher frequencies from 10 hertz to gigahertz are open tools, open hole tools. Here in the gigahertz range are dielectric tools. Uh, this is the name of the tools, which is not so important. And the activation is all of these tools are active in the logging world. And this, I think, is the biggest spectrum of where you can derive different type of technologies. Um, for surface geophysics, we have land and marine from zero hertz up to about uh, um, 100 kilohertz. And then you have airborne geophysics from about um, 1000 hertz to uh, approximately one megahertz. So, where does the signal come from that we measure? We have the sun, and the sun is on the left side, and the sun has sunspots and solar outbursts. Um, and these solar outbursts, they send electrical particles towards the Earth. And these electrical particles are blowing the uh, magnetic the solar wind is blowing and meeting the magnetic field lines of the Earth's magnetic field. And we have another cartoon in a second to show you what's happening with these. 
And so there they interact. They get trapped in the magnetic field lines. They travel around and electrical current flows. And then um, they, uh, because they get trapped, they induce a signal into the Earth. And we measure on the Earth's surface the response of these effects. So let's see what's happening. We have first the Earth with its magnetic field. And the sun is on the left side. And this is the magnetic field is deformed. Then we have a solar outburst. And uh, the solar wind um, distorts the Earth's magnetic field. And it sort of bends over in the back. And then it connects in the back. And this connect makes a short. And then electrical currents flow in here. Um, this is in the, these are electrical currents in the ionosphere. The ionosphere is essentially the atmospheric layer above the mesopause, and the mesopause stops at about 50 kilometers above the Earth. And in the mesopause is the weather and the meteorology and all of the thunderstorms and so forth. So when we talk about ionosphere, that's very far away from the Earth. And ionospheric currents are flowing in the magnetic field lines far away from the Earth. So after they've made a short, you make a loop, and these currents are flowing in here. And then these currents induce a field in the Earth. And by the time they meet the Earth, they are a plane wave. And you can see that here on the left slide. Do you see my mouse? Yes, we can see. Now, for the signals that are happening in, in the mesosphere, which is in the lower 50 kilometers, uh, the signals we use there are thunder, uh, thunderstorms. And here is a picture from NASA. And um, uh, we have Indonesia, so Sulawesi is here. Where are you located? You're not on Java, right? Well, we are in Lampung, which is in Sumatra Island. So Sumatra is here? Yes, that's correct. OK. No, so, it's near, uh, we are near the Java. So you are north of Java, right? No, we are southern of Sumatra. So you are here? Yeah, it's nearby. Yeah. OK. So. This is an area of high thunderstorm activity. So you will get a lot of thunderstorm activities. This is a signal in the higher frequency band below 20 kilohertz. Just to give you an idea of what is happening with the skin effect, and um, the skin depth is usually the depth at which the um, signal has declared to uh, by 63%. And the skin depth is defined as, in meters, 503 times the square root of the resistivity divided by the frequency. Uh, and this is in meters. So here we have low frequencies. In low frequencies, we have a larger skin depth. And um, in higher frequencies, we have a smaller skin depth. So this is what this figure is supposed to show. So for land magnetotellurics, we lay out three magnetic sensors, usually coils. We also use different sensors. And two electric fields in x and y direction. We calculate the ratio of the um, electric field in x direction and the magnetic field in y direction. And we get a directional resistivity as a function of frequency. Multiply this with 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.2 times the frequency. And um, then we do that also for another direction. And they don't necessarily have to be the same. If these quantities are the same, the Earth is horizontally layered or one dimensional. If they are different, the Earth is two or three dimensional. So this is a very good way to get directional dependence of your signal um, of the Earth. Now, in marine, as the principle is clear, we have um, the waves coming in, um, the electromagnetic waves, and they hit, hit a reservoir. And if it's a thin reservoir and has a high resistivity contrast, you have uh, a capacitor effect 
uh, or direct hydrocarbon effect. Um, and um, you get an enhancement of the resistor by having uh, uh, two capacitors in this case. If it's thicker, you lose that enhancement, but you still see it. And if it's much thicker than that, you it becomes a shielding one. You lose your signal. And then the secondary field that gets produced, the secondary response from the reservoir, gets measured by the receivers that are on the ocean floor or on land. For controlled source, that means we bring now our own source, we inject our own field, we um, have a grounded dipole that injects a current, and the current flows from one end to the other, and as you saw, it goes downwards and outwards with increasing time. The propagation downwards comes from the transmitter, the outwards propagation comes from the layer interface. As soon as this, the electromagnetic waves hit a layer interface, the um, uh, electromagnetic field goes outwards. You then have a receiver, and each of the components can give you the full information of the resistivity of the subsurface. So you take multi-components, and you get redundant information. This is the transmitter signal. You inject the current. You reverse the polarity in this case and you get a signal that goes up, down, up, down, and so forth. Now, this signal, watch it, it's moving. And here you see, essentially, with time, how the signal moves down. This is the transmitter, these are the receivers, and this is the 2D sensitivity function for these three receivers. There is a fourth one, I guess it got lost by the memory issues with this presentation. It's starting again, it's a loop. Um, what this shows is that at the same time, the information comes from the same depths, irrespective of offset. Thing which most people don't understand, that in the frequency domain and dipole-dipole, the depths and offset are uh, Related, you have to have two and a half times or two times at least the distance, um, two times the depths as distance between transmitter and receiver. In the time domain, you can go directly next to the transmitter and you can get the full depths. Okay, this is just a summary of the methods we are using for the case histories. The first case history from Iceland uses magnetic tellurics, um, and um, the second one also, and the third one uses uh, low temper control source CM. Um, in Iceland, we have all volcanic material. The entire section is volcanic. The target zone, the target was to find an additional reservoir to feed the power plant. The existing reservoir doesn't feed the power plant completely, and uh, they, they, they have a bigger power plant than they producing, and uh, we needed to integrate our data together with the existing TEM data, which went to a depth to 800 meters. slide. So this, uh, this is the slide you couldn't see earlier. So what you have here is the Earth, and you have a land control source EM system with some receivers. Marine, um, you can also have controlled source AM as well as MT, and borehole installations in deviated holes and vertical holes. Here you have basalt flow, where you're looking sub-basalt, deep basalt under the in the marine environment that's commonly done in India. Then you can do borehole measurements for surface to borehole measurements. You can also look after volcanoes where you have sub basalt measurements, like here. This is trap basalt, like in Brazil and India, and this is basalt volcanic material, like in Indonesia. And on the right side, you have geothermal heat source, and you're essentially measuring a lower conductivity area, which is an area of higher temperature. Now, the example I show you from Germany is looking subsalt, like this, 
Anenesia. The one from India is looking subbasalt. And from Iceland, it's looking inside the basalt itself in a geothermal setting like this. This is the power plant. There are more people in the power plant, namely seven operating that power plant, than there are people living there. The largest, um, um, the largest um, living creature uh, in that area are sheep. So this is the area. Um, it's in this part of Iceland. And you are essentially, these are the different uh, um, geothermal fields. And you essentially have multiple sweet spot areas that they're trying to uh, produce hot water from to feed the power plant. And essentially, you have a geologic string of material going through like this through the country. So. Um, this is the satellite picture with the survey lines drawn on it, and these are the survey lines uh, on the right side. This is the 3D grid, and these are just the survey lines themselves. You'll repeat the survey lines in the next upcoming sections. So here you see the 3D patch and the sites, and the sites are, of course, different than they were originally planned because you had to walk the equipment uh, to the site. Um, we used multiple systems there, and here are the three systems compared at the beginning of the survey in um, x, y, and y, x direction to just see that the systems give consistent results and we could maintain the calibration. Uh, this is the raw data display, and um, um, yeah, there's not much to be said. I mean, this is just the um, X, Y, and Y, X component um, of system of site number I-104. And uh, this is uh, data around the well. There were several different um, data sets recorded um, with different systems and different equipment of different universities, and they all gave pretty much uh, very similar results. Uh, this is the inversion from the Icelanders from their loop source, TEM. They used the big loop source, and it goes up to um, approximately 800 meters steps from a few hundred meters above sea level to minus 500 meters. And they're using inversion to get this information and the um, red shows low resistivity, um, and the red is the hotter zone. And they're trying to find another hot zone, as they have here, um, at a greater depth. So the MT measurements clearly showed another um, conductor or hot zone or resistive zone at six to nine kilometers. Um, and if you look at the 3D inversion, you see these conductors also. There's also one at about uh, one at five, one at seven that we saw before. But there's also something shallower in some parts of the section, uh, four kilometers, somewhere here, this area here, and here, this area. The red is the more conductive part. Um, and these are the 2D inversions. And um, again, you have some breaks in here, but this one is probably more likely. There's a lot more work being done there. And um, this goes to 14 kilometer steps. And this is the comparison of the data with the logs. There are uh, three logs and the resistivity logs show pretty much what we have here is the high resistive part and they're pretty much consistent with the higher resistivities here 
you have um, just look at the scale. This is about 400 ohm meters. So you are here in approximately 400 ohm meters with the log, and that's about the same color where you are with the blue. So this matches very nicely, and here as well. And here you go lower, which is in this part. So the logs match the results from the MT inversion quite nicely. And as interpretation, we thought that uh, we could clearly see some lower um, um, some lower deeper um, hydrothermal reservoirs that were being um, recharged and um, uh, make a potential target. Erica may know if they have drilled by now. This is, was quite some time ago. So, again, here's the comparison with the geologic cross section with the borehole. Um, and this is PG3, which is this borehole right here. And again, you can see how the resistivities match nicely. It, they go up to, this is the higher resistivity. So, this is about 300 ohm meters. Uh, which would be about this color here, which is close. And then here it's lower. It's about uh, 100 ohm meters, and this is also very close. So the, it seems like the MT interpretation matches the logs that exist in the area quite well. And this is a picture showing 200 amps in one way current, and then when it switches, it shows 200 amps in the other way. Um, so supper salt, this is, I also have MT parts of a lecture, but I didn't show it here. Um, was done with, can be done with uh, MT or CSEM. Uh, there's a lot of mature applications available in the industry now. It's slow to catch on commercial uh, because there needs to be local acquisition contractor. And MT gives a good background model, and control source can be used for more specific targets. Questions, India? Okay, anyone has a question? You can just unmute your microphone and then just speak directly. Okay. Uh, I think no one. Okay, I have a question. I have a question. So, uh, Kurt, did you hear me? Uh, yeah, of course I can hear you. you uh, I have a speaker on the entire time. <laughs> okay, uh, as I tell you before. So, uh, actually in uh, Indonesia, we don't have a uh, cell zone. So, we can also like uh, apply this method uh, similar to India, which is the uh, volcanic rock. And then since we know that volcanic has uh, the higher resistivity, and then when we apply for the oil, uh, for the oil and gas, which is the also high resistivity. So how we distinguish between uh, the oil and then the volcanic rock itself? You don't. Thank you. You yeah, have so to know the, more, more about the geology. You have to correlate it with other measurements. You saw that in India, that the initial model said that the Silurian sediments of high resistivity were going into a basement. They had never drilled through it. They then accidentally drilled a well in the catch two and a half kilometers through the basalt at the bottom. That basalt layer is two kilometers thick. And below that basalt layer is oil. So now every exploration program in India has to have EM. Okay. You have to yeah. drill through it. You have to understand the geology. But from a resistivity viewpoint, there's no way to distinguish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any question? Yeah, maybe from my students. Hello, guys. Okay.
So I think that there is no question. Rika, do you have any question? Not right now. Uh, thank you. Okay. So you can continue, girl. Okay. Um, so Hungary is sedimentary area. It's very rich in um, in low entropy geothermal resources. Actually, it's wrong. It's enthalpy, not entropy. Um, the reliability of previous MT data was bad. Earlier surveys were not aimed for geothermal exploration. They were aimed for understanding the basins. Where are the basins? And we performed MT and gravity surveys for potential geothermal evaluation in the entire country. The, our client only got licenses in those areas where there were no other licenses for hydrocarbon given. Um, the drilling showed success in the first well and produced four megawatt. More drilling is ongoing and planned, but as in many of these cases, everything became very political and they didn't do any more geophysics. So this is Hungary. And these are the areas where we did MT surveys. Um, and um, this is the equipment we used, gravity meter. And um, we were looking to find localized geothermal area to, for electricity and space heating. They were going to have um, well pairs to inject and produce through a second well. Uh, they were looking at uh, 90 to 170 degrees C at two to three kilometers and hoping to get a gradient of 50 degrees C per kilometer. Now that is relatively high. What is the normal geothermal gradient, Mr. Andri Yadi Pembonan? Pardon? What is the normal average geothermal gradient? Oh, I don't know. 30 degrees C per kilometer. In Indonesia, it's higher. You could be getting close. So 50 is pretty good. Um, the detailed target zone, uh, we are looking for a detailed target zone with boundaries. We did about 500 MT sites and 2,000 gravity sites and integrated both of it. We mapped low resistive and low density targets, selected the drill site, and um, et cetera, et cetera. And the water was 90 degrees. So I'll talk a little bit um, about the processing flow. The MT data was first the data was edited for obvious noise. Then we did static corrections for near surface inhomogeneities and terrain corrections. And the gravity processing was upward continued and the gravity gradient was calculated. We then did a cooperative inversion of MT and gravity data. That means you take two people, you put one person in one machine and the other one in the other machine. And then uh, there is one person looking over the shoulder of both of them and says, you do this and you do that. And then both of them get the similar results. You say, bingo. So that's known as cooperative inversion. So here is the um, uh, data. And this is in a 2D display in the X, Y and uh, uh, direction on the left side is the apparent. Here is the apparent resistivity, this is the phase. And here as well and below are the model responses, the 2D responses, and they match reasonable well in a 2D sense. So this is done in the 2D mode. So first the data was matched, so you get got reliable models. Then um, we took the background 2D MT reverse inversion results and determine a background model. And we subtracted the regional resistivity field and we were left with a local resistivity anomaly, which then looked like this. So you just do a simple subtraction from the 2D and you are left with this part. So that's how you were looking for anomalous zones. You then do the same thing with the gravity. You have the anomalous zones left over, and here these are density numbers. 
this is the data, this is the calculated gravity in green and, and observed gravity in green and the calculated gravity in red. And so you change the model until this green and the red curve match. Uh, there is another slide that shows that, but not in this presentation. Then you make uh, the 2D model also match those models. And when you have models that match both, you compare it with potential fault zones. So these are areas where we got potential fault zones. Uh, these are the surface view and these are the section view um, from this, uh, the seismic lines. There were some vintage seismic lines. So this is done, the work by the, this work is done by the geologist. And then you take through these fault zones, you overlap your resistivities and you say, aha, these are two fault zones where the anomalies overlap. And uh, here are the, actually this is wrong. These are both plane views, these are not section views. So here these overlap uh, these two zones and then we go into the interpretation. And the geologist is here the most important part. He keeps redoing those geologic models based on the seismic. This is a seismic. And this is the well they drilled finally. And we did several 3D inversions afterwards. Every time he updated the model, where the low resistivity anomaly, which is also a low density anomaly. Low resistivity means hot water. Low density means more water. So we are looking for an area that has a lot of water and the water is hot. And so this is this anomaly. And then they needed to locate within this anomaly the drill side. And for that, we redid the 3D models every time when they had the new model afterwards. And so here the well was drilled and um, uh, there's hot water coming out. And the depth was right on target that there was one, I think we predicted 1,550 meters and they got it at 1,570 or 80 meters. So it was uh, very, very successful. So we interpreted two first-class deep faults and several second-class shallow faults in that area um, and um, interpreted the, this, uh, the heat flow and the water was 85 degrees C. So that was hot enough to uh, produce space heating and uh, um, um, et cetera. 